And the motivation for the plan had been the fact that some expensive whiskey illegally imported from Canada via the Detroit River had been hijacked while being transported to Cook County, Illinois. So somebody stole some illegal whiskey. This is a really bad idea. Prohibition was such a bad idea. It didn't do it. any good for anyone. It really Except did not. organized crime. It really did good things for organized crime, but that's about it. <laughs> Moran was actually the last survivor of the Northside gunman. His succession had come about because his similarly, similarly aggressive predecessors, Jaime Weiss and Vincent Drusi, had been killed in the violence that followed the murder of the original leader, Dean O'Banion because apparently okay. that's the one Irish dude there's no yeah. Irish dudes left they've all been shot because no one has ever just been voted in it's always bloody so they're what? like Irish dude dead Irish dude dead we're all out of Irish dudes okay Jewish dude going in there <laughs> I don't know if you're German I don't care go in there I don't know what you are but nobody's left go in there that's kind of what it sounds like well let's go back to you say Vice what was yes. his first name I mean H-Y-M-I-E. <laughs> okay. And then it's Hi-me. Weiss. W-E-I-E-S-S. I assumed that was German. I, I assumed I it was Weiss. but German? I don't know. I got Would stuck be... on Jaime. I thought surely I Jaime? just heard that, but apparently nope. no. Okay. No. okay. Uh, yeah, the original was Dean O'Banion. I assumed that was the one Irish dude, and then they just took him out, and then you're done. Um, so it was only an Irish mob because it was started by an Irish man. And then they all killed each other. So we don't care what you are. Just get in here. Whoever's left standing. Uh, that guy. He's not even Irish. Neither are any of us. We all, they all died. <laughs> We're Irish in tradition. <laughs> in tradition. Just eat your potatoes and shut up. Yes. <laughs> Dude, if potatoes um, were the only requisite, I would be Irish. I would too. I would. I, I'm a little Irish, but yeah. <laughs> I'm a little Irish, but that's fine. I'm mostly Polish though. So I'm like, potatoes, sign me up. No. Um, several factors contributed to the timing of the plan to kill Moran. Earlier in the year, Northsider Frank Gusenberg and his brother Peter unsuccessfully attempted to murder Jack McGurn. The Northside gang was complicit in the murders of Pascalino, Patsy, Lorodo, and Antonio the Scourge Lombardo. Nobody ever has a nice name. The Scourge. I could see that being like a, a comic book character. Right? The Scourge Lombardo. Yeah! Both had been presidents of the Union Sicilina, the local mafia, and close associates of Capone. Now, obviously, they are Italian. Mm-hmm. Um, Moran and Capone had been vying for control of the lucrative Chicago bootlegging trade. Always a bad idea to ban alcohol. Don't do that. <laughs> <sighs> Moran had been muscling in on the Capone run dog track in the Chicago suburbs. Please leave the dogs alone. Nothing ever good happens to the dogs. And he had taken over several saloons that were run by Capone, insisting that they were in his territory. So clearly, he had to die. Like, he kind of just put some big-ass target on himself. So the plan... I just don't know why you would start a pissing match with Al Capone. Like, well, I think that would be blatantly a bad idea. Back then, it was just another mob boss. He wasn't Al Capone, like we know. Not notorious, I hear you. Not notorious. But at the same time, dude sounded fucking scary from day one. I just... I swear, it's just ego. It's all a bunch of ego. Like, yeah. they think, I'm, I'm a badass. I'm better than this badass. But... I don't know. Dude was scary. Like, just looking at him, he was scary. I don't know if I've ever seen a picture of Al Capone. I'm sure I had to have. I'm sure I had to have. I've been through, like, the Alcatraz Prison Museum thing. I'm sure once you see a picture of him, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that guy. That guy. I had to have. But nothing's coming to mind. I have no mental image of Al Capone. And once you see him, you'll be like, oh, yeah, it's that guy. Actually, I think Robert De Niro is what comes to, (laughs) to mind. Like, Al Capone equals Robert De Niro in my head. That is not the same. No. <laughs> um, oh, I, I doubt I, it's the same. I encourage you to Google um, after this episode. You might actually be disappointed because he's kind of like just like a squat, round, bald guy with oh. big lips and a cigar. Like he doesn't look terribly sinister, but when you know all the shit that he's responsible for, you're like, Ugh. 
Well, now I'm thinking but, Danny DeVito with a cigar. Okay, not that squad. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not like moving Penguin on. from Batman. <laughs> moving on. Okay, moving on. The plan was to lure Moran and the SMC Cartage Warehouse. Oh, I'm sorry. The plan was to lure Moran to the SMC Cartage Warehouse on the North Street on February 14th, 1929, to kill him and perhaps two or three of his lieutenants. It is usually assumed that the North Siders were lured to the garage with a promise of stolen cut rate shipment of whiskey supplied by Detroit's Purple Gang, which was associated with Capone. I really think they were just running out of ideas for <laughs> names. Like they had the North Side Gang. All right, that's fine. Then they had like the Rat Gang. All right. Then the Purple Gang. Where did okay. that come from? I don't know. Maybe they all were purple. Maybe they like were busy on like gang name day and that was the only one left and i'm like god damn it <laughs> they got stuck with it short straw right, fine. <laughs> make the purple gang sound menacing ah. yeah fine the Gusenberg brothers were supposed to drive two empty trucks to detroit that day to pick up two loads of stolen canadian whiskey all of the victims were dressed in their best clothes with the exception of john may probably because he's a mechanic and grease stains yeah that makes sense i mean that's my guess Apparently, it was customary for the North Siders and other gangsters at this time is to be dressed up in your best clothes. Uh, most of the Moran gang had arrived at the warehouse at approximately 1030, but Moran was not there. He had left his Parkway Hotel apartment late. Oversleeping saves the day. At least for him. He and a fellow gang member, Ted Newberry, approached the rear of the warehouse from the side street when they saw a police car approaching the building. They immediately dipped to a nearby coffee shop because they're like, fuck that. They encountered another gang member, Henry Goosenberg, because apparently all the Goosenbergs were involved in this gang. All of them. A true family business. It is a true family business. I mean, yeah. And they warned him, so he too dipped out. And then there was another Northside gang member named Willie Marks, who also sparta, spotted the police car on his way to the garage. And he ducked into a doorway, jotted down the license number, and got the fuck out. Because he also had the smarts. Interesting. He jotted down the license number of the Cop of the police car? car? Yeah, what like I'm gonna do sure. with that. I don't know what I'm he was confused. gonna do with I I mean I would get jotting down the license plate of a car that looks suspicious, but I don't know why the cop car. Yeah, I don't know. And you're uh, part of organized crime. What are you gonna do? Go ask the well, maybe ask a dirty cop to run the license. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking, but apparently he was thinking something. And he Apparently. went, you know, maybe he was going to, like, find out who the fuck the tipped <laughs> off those whoever. And, I don't know. <laughs> maybe he just had a moment where he panicked. And he's he like, I don't like, know what to do. Jot this down. It might be important. <laughs> okay. Oh, another aside. But Steve and I were watching Eli Stone. And there's an episode where he's, like, hallucinating about an earthquake. And so uh -huh. he's running through the apartment, panicked, and like the whole rest of the episode, he can't let go of the fact that in his panic state, what he thought to do was grab a goose statue and leave the apartment. And he was I so mean... stuck on the fact, like, what was I going to do with a goose statue? And that's what I'm hearing right now. <laughs> like... Yes, he's like, uh, I don't know what to write this down. It'll do something later. <laughs> I don't know, but that's what he did. Who knows? That's what that I'm was his panic in my head right now. Okay, his that was his move. goose statue. <laughs> panic move goose statue was to write down that license plate number. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe he was trying to figure out who tipped off the cops because they were being offered this illegal whiskey. The cops were there. Maybe he wanted to know who tipped off the cops. I don't know. I got nothing. nothing. That's just what the information said. But he got the fuck out of there. It was a goose statue moment, which. For me, I would probably grab the goose because panic. I want to take my <laughs> goose with me. I don't want to leave that behind in an earthquake. I but, you know, know, whatever. So, Capone's lookouts likely mistook one of Moran's men for Moran himself. Probably the Albert Weinshank, who was the same height and build physically. Mm -hmm. um, and they dressed the same that morning. Both happened to be wearing the same color overcoats and hats. Probably because they had the same tailor because they're in the same fucking gang. Makes sense. Witnesses outside the garage saw a Cadillac sedan pull to a stop in front of the garage. Four men emerged and walked outside. I'm sorry, walked inside. Two of them dressed in police uniforms. 
The two police officers who are the fake police officers, not so sure if they're fake, because again, could be real cops, could be mm-hmm. getting revenge for the dead cop's son. No, cop's dead son. Uh, so they entered the rear portion of the garage where they found the members of the Moran's gang and the collaborators, Reinhard Schwimmer and John May. So the optometrist with a gambling problem and the sometimes mechanic. Okay. And he was doing what he does, fixing up one of the trucks. The fake policeman ordered the men to line up against the wall because, you know, shake down, line up against the wall. You're going to get arrested. Uh Then they signaled them in the civilian clothes to accompany them. They said, you know, hey, do your thing. And instead of like, you know, arresting them, they opened fire with Tommy guns, one with a 20 round box magazine and the other with a 50 round drum. And apparently they were extremely thorough, spraying their victims from left to right, even continuing to fire after all seven had hit the floor. Two shotgun blasts afterward all but obliterated the faces of John May and James Clark, according to the coroner's report. Which, dude, John May was the fucking mechanic. Why did they care if his face was obliterated? He was one of the gang members. I know. Like, he he was the fucking mechanic. What did he have to do with any of that? I would think shotgun to the face is personal. Right? That's not business. But that's personal. Again, yeah. But to give the appearance everything was under control, the men in the street clothes came out with their hands up, prodded by the two uniformed police. So again, oh. anyone who heard the gunshot would think, oh, hey, the police are on this. No big deal. Inside, the only survivors of the warehouse were May's dog, Highball. Because they are mobsters, not monsters. At Got least there's that. Also, our dude, Frank Gusenberg, despite the 14 bullet wounds. Although we do know that he does not survive for long. Just long enough to say, I didn't get shot. I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. Death. From Death. 14 bullet wounds. Imaginary, apparently, because he never Imaginary. Because he <laughs> fell on 14 bullets. Or fell on one bullet 14 times. Whatever. I don't know. So... The Valentine's Day massacre set off a public outcry because holy hell, why wouldn't it? I mean, and yeah. This, this posed a problem for all mob bosses. Like, oh shit, maybe we shouldn't be so out in the open because holy fuck. Yeah. Within days, Capone received a summons to testify before a Chicago grand jury on charges of federal prohibition violations because that's the only fucking thing they could get him on. Jesus. But he claimed he was too unwell to untend. Oh, no. It was common knowledge that Moran was hijacking Capone's Detroit-based liquor shipments, and police focused their attention on Detroit's predominantly Jewish Purple Gang. Okay, so the Purple Gang was Jewish. Maybe there's something to do with Jewish faith and Purple. I don't know. I should have done some more research on that. So maybe they didn't get slighted. Maybe they purposefully chose the Purple Gang and it has something to do with the Jewish faith. Maybe. I don't know. Anybody who is a Hebrew listener, give us a shout out if purple means anything to Hebrew people. Other than it is a cool color. You know? I like it. I put it in my hair all the time. It's true. What it has to do with being a scary mobster? Not sure. But let us know. no idea. So landladies, Mrs. Duty and Mrs. Orvidson had taken in three men as rumors 10 days before the massacre, and their rooming houses were directly across the street from the North Clark Street garage. They picked out much mug shots of Purple Gang members George Lewis, Eddie Filcher, Phil Keywall, and his younger brother Harry, but they later waived in their identification. Or they wavered in their identification. They thought that, oh, maybe that's not who they are? Mm-hmm. Okay. So they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's that guy, that guy, that guy, that guy. Oh, wait, maybe it's not. So they, the police questioned and then cleared Fletcher, Lewis, and Harry, nevertheless, the Keywell brothers, and by extension, the Purple Gang, remained associated with the crime in the years that followed. Many also believed that the police were involved, which may have been the intention of the killers. The police may have been involved because that policeman who lost his son. Right. On February 22nd, police were called to the scene of a garage fire on Wood Street where they found a 1927 Cadillac sedan dissembled and partially burned, and they determined that the killers had used the car. They traced the engine number to a Michigan Avenue dealer who had sold the car to a James Morton of Los Angeles. 
The car had been rented by a man calling himself Frank Rogers, who gave his address as 1859 West North Avenue. This address.